Israel is uh, one that I probably have struggled with uh, most of my life. Uh, it seems that the, the message here is that you know, God will supply all of our material needs and our wants. We don't need to pay attention to uh, worrying about what we're going to eat or what we're going to wear because all of that's going to be taken care of for us by God. That's what the text says. And yet, you look around. I mean, even in Lewiston, which is a fairly um, guarded position, a, a, a rather utopian place compared to many parts of the world, we still collect food every week for the food bank here in Lewiston. There's a, a fair level of poverty even present in our own backyard. But that pales in comparison to the level of poverty that is present around the globe. So we have an issue here of Jesus telling us that God supplies every material need that we could want and the reality of the conditions of people and the circumstances all around the globe. And it is this tension that I have wrestled with for all of these years. I, I don't know necessarily how to reconcile that. Now to make matters worse, I think that this particular saying of Jesus, this story, this pericope that we find in Matthew, uh, it is present not only in Matthew, but it's also present in Luke. And Bible scholars also think that it probably appeared in the source document Q. If you already know what Q is, then you're ahead of the game. If you don't, uh, a brief lesson is that the authors of both Matthew and Luke Bible scholars think used two different sources to write their Gospels. Now, one source was the Gospel of Mark, which was dated a little bit earlier, and it's believed that they both had a copy of Mark. That other source document is Q, and it's believed that Q might even predate Mark. So Q is a document that we don't have an actual copy of. It has been reconstructed, and there's published copies that are in fact simile of what we think Q might have looked like. But the dating on Q places it as the closest document to the time when Jesus actually lived of any document that we have. And so what that means is it's very likely that Jesus spoke these words or something very close to this. And as I said, that complicates this a little bit for me because sometimes in the New Testament or the Old Testament you can kind of do a, a workaround with the text by saying, well, this is somebody's interpretation or this is something somebody redacted or changed in, in whatever way. But that's not the case with this particular story. This is something that Jesus is likely to have said. And so that brings me back around to this little dilemma that I have in terms of um, what Jesus said about God supplying all of our needs uh, in a material sense and the fact that a high percentage of the population of the world struggles every day to find the food that they need or the shelter that they need or the clothing that they need. And so we have this gap. And sometimes we don't know what to do with that gap. But I decided today to confront my anxiety about that uh, and to work once again with the text and kind of work through what I think Jesus is trying to tell us. And one of those things that Jesus, I think, is trying to tell us is that this text is not about God providing every need. It's not what the text is about. I recognize that that's what he says, but that's not what the text is about. The text that I read is 11 verses long. And in those 11 verses, we find the instructions not to worry five times. Essentially, it's every other verse. It says, 
you know, da 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 da, don't worry, da 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 da, don't worry, da da da, don't worry. And so the text, in my mind, really is about not worrying. As I said, in the 11 verses that we are, that I read, we're told not to worry at least five times. And that is essentially every other verse as we work our way through this. Now, this isn't something that you're going to find written in the commentaries and so on, but uh, in my mind, the main idea here is, that, is not that everything is going to be okay. The main idea here is to not worry about everything not being okay. That's a little off, okay? So I'm going to read it again. The main idea is not that everything will be okay. The main idea is not to worry about everything not being okay. So let me just explore that idea for you for a minute. If you were to look up this text and read some commentaries, there's a couple of things that you might find. One school of thought, one uh, answer to this question is that Jesus never intended these instructions to be for public consumption. In other words, the, the scholarship in, around this idea is that this was a conversation that he had with his disciples, and it was a, a closed group, and the message was to the disciples that they, he want, Jesus wanted his disciples to pay more attention to the ministry than they were going to pay attention to the logistics. So he wanted to send his disciples out to spread the good news and he said, don't worry about how you're going to get there or, you know, who you're going to eat with or, you know, those things will work themselves out. Just worry about the ministry. Okay, well, I can accept that as maybe partially filling that gap. But I really think we need to dig a little bit deeper than that. We need to unpack this in some way so that we can begin to understand at a baser level what Jesus was maybe communicating. Even if he was just talking to his disciples, that still is a tall order. It's a, a, a big thing for us to take on and to think about. Now, some of the other scholarship that I checked with, some of the other commentaries, you know, they treat this text very superficially. I mean, it's a shallow uh, treatment. They simply say, Oh, trust God. Have faith. They zero in on that idea that the text said, you know, you of little faith. And the, the notion that the, the unspoken idea behind that kind of scholarship is that if you are prosperous, if you are wealthy, if everything is going your way, if all of the things are happening that you want to happen, then you have faith and you're trusting God and God is blessing you. And I tell you, that is the theology that was present in ancient Judaism with the scribes and the Pharisees and that is exactly the theology that Jesus railed against. He did not agree with that approach at all. And it is still present today. Sometimes you may have heard this referred to as the prosperity gospel. Has anybody ever heard that term? Okay. Uh, not 100% reliable. Not 100% accurate, in my opinion. I believe that our connection to the divine, our connection to God, our spiritual well-being is completely detached from our physical circumstances. They are two entirely separate things. And I think that is the beginning of what Jesus was trying to communicate. That you have two different things going on here. You have a spiritual connection and then you have whatever you are experiencing with your physical circumstances in a different realm. So what this entails is in the second half 
of the opening verse. Jesus tells us, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Right after he says, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Right after he says, don't worry about what you're going to wear. You know, he's speaking and he's saying, don't worry about all these things. And then he says, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? That is a verse that I think we kind of sometimes just blow right by when we're reading this text. We don't really pick up on what is there. But what is there is Jesus is saying to us that there are things in life that are more important than what we eat. There are things in life more important than what we wear. And honestly, and this sits a little uncomfortably, there are things more important in life than if we eat. Okay? There is a message in there about the separation between our physical circumstances and our spiritual well-being. If we worry about material things, it leaves no room for us to contemplate the spiritual things. In other words, worry, anxiety, is a little bit like an unbaked loaf of bread. And you take that unbaked loaf of bread and you put it in almost any size pan, and you put it in the oven and it blows up to whatever space it has. And worry is a little bit like that. Worry and anxiety just blows up and it fills up all of your space. However much space you have, it fills it up. And at that point, it leaves no room for you to contemplate your spiritual self, your spiritual disciplines, your connection to God, the connection that we have to the divine spirit, the divine energy that is all around us. So this is a, a difficult concept. And if this text is primarily about the instruction, do not worry, then it really raises the question for us about, okay, that's easy to say. Don't worry. Yeah, right. But how do we do it? What are the... How do you not worry? How do you eliminate anxiety? How do you remove that from your life? How can you, you know, just be at peace? Well, it's not easy. Not easy at all. And learning to worry, I think, have, has three aspects to it. And these three steps are sequential. You, you cannot move directly into step three. You kind of have to move into step one, and then move to step two, and then eventually you get to step three. But for me, the process of learning to not worry, the process of learning to eliminate anxiety out of your life, the process of getting rid of some of those things that occupy space and allows you to focus on being the spiritual person that you are, begins with recognizing that anxiety, worry, or frustration about what you can't change is futile. That's, that's step one. Now, a lot of people never progress past that. <laughs> okay? Uh, when we were serving, the, when I and I were serving the church in Denver, it was a common occurrence, you know, three times a week, uh, you'd get stuck on the freeway in traffic. You can't control that. You can't change that. And it would drive people crazy. They would just go insane because they were stuck in traffic. That level of frustration, that anger, that anxiety, because now they're going to be late for that meeting, or you know this is going to happen, or that's going to take place, all because they're stuck in traffic, and they just go crazy in their minds. Well, that's a choice. You have the choice whether you're going to feel good or whether you're going to feel bad. And if you were happy to be stuck in traffic, or if somebody pulls out in front of you, or something else goes wrong, you have a choice. 
You can remember the last time you felt really good. And you can remember what it was that you were thinking about. You can remember where you were. You can remember what was going on. And you can choose to remember those things that feel good. Or you can choose to focus on what you can't change and be upset and have worry and anxiety and frustration. If you can get to that point where you recognize a situation that you say, you know, I can't change that. It just is the way that it is right now in this space, in this time and place. I can't do anything about it, so I'm going to feel good. I'm just going to choose that I'm going to feel good. If you can accomplish that, that is step one. Steps two and three, a little bit more difficult. Step two looks like this. It says, learn to receive information about your circumstances without judgment and without worry. Ooh, okay. <laughs> it's like, I just bought the winning lottery ticket. Okay? You receive that information with overwhelming joy. And you think, oh, this is great. And then, you know, you get, you pick up the mail and there's a bill that you didn't expect. And then, uh, you know, it's like me. You, know, you, know, you get the overdraft notice. You know, I can't be overdrawn. I still have checks left. But uh, <clears throat> you learn to receive information about your circumstances without judgment and without worry. Actually being able to say in the middle of whatever it is that's going on that it is neither good nor bad. Without judgment and without worry. To be able to remove yourself from that situation and simply say this is what it is right now. I have to admit to you that I've been working on this for decades. <laughs> and it's not easy stuff. But I think this is the essential message of what Jesus was trying to communicate to us in the text that I read. It was, you know, this is that separation of what we're talking about. And then finally, step three. Learn to receive your circumstances with thanksgiving. If you can get to the point where you can not label them good or bad, that they simply are, then you can receive those circumstances with an attitude of gratitude, with thanksgiving. And then you can grow spiritually to the point that you can learn to contribute, show compassion, help others, spread the love of God, do the kinds of things that we are called to do. Now, this is the pinnacle, kind of, of what I consider to be enlightenment. This is what it means to, you know, follow Jesus. This is what it means to really be engaged in a Christian life. I think of someone like Mother Teresa on the streets of Calcutta, surrounded by unimaginable poverty. Being able to get past the worry and the frustration and the anxiety of not being able to help everybody and to not being able to change that situation. To be, accept what that was and yet to be able to say, I receive that information. I receive those circumstances with thanksgiving. And I'm thankful to have the opportunity to do what I can. And to change people's lives one life at a time. That is the essence of what Jesus, I think, was trying to tell us. You see, this level of thought, this level of enlightenment, points us into the direction of recognizing that we really are spiritual beings. Now, a lot of us consider ourselves to be human beings, and we don't think much about the spiritual. But let me tell you that 
It's my belief that we have always been spiritual beings. We are spiritual beings now, and we always will be spiritual beings. In other words, we are not human beings searching around looking for some sort of a spiritual experience. That's not what we are. We're the flip side of that. We are spiritual beings in the midst of a human experience. Now given that perspective of all eternity, we have been spiritual beings. And in this present time, in this moment, we continue to be spiritual beings. And forever on, we will be spiritual beings. This human experience is just a blink. Just a fleeting moment in time. It really is not that consequential. And the material aspects of this human experience are even less consequential. And I think that is the attitude, that is the essence of what Jesus is trying to communicate in this text. That yes, there's a gap. Yes, there are things in the world that need to be worked on, need to be changed. And that is our human experience. Now, as I study this, as I grapple with this concept, as I say I've been working on some of these things for decades, I've run across an interesting observation. And this observation comes to us from some of the Eastern faith traditions, um, like Buddhism, for example, or Taoism, um, where they say that a person before enlightenment, okay, before they begin to wrap their head around who they are supposed to be in the universe, who they really are in terms of the spiritual being. They may ask the question, and pay attention to the inflection here, but they will ask the question before enlightenment, why is this happening to me? In other words, they want reasons. They want an answer. I have done absolutely everything right, and yet everything's a mess. Why? Why is this happening to me? I don't deserve this. I am a good person. I, you know, I go to church. I, uh, 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 and why is this happening to me? I just don't understand it. And the why there really focuses on the material essence of who we are. The why asks those kinds of questions. The why sets up that tension. The why allows us to worry. The why fosters a certain level of anxiety. After enlightenment, somebody will ask the very same question, using the very same words. They say, why is this happening to me? Why is it that I have this particular opportunity right now to learn what lesson can I take away from this experience that I'm having right now? How can I take this circumstance that I find myself in and help other people? How can I grow spiritually because of my human experience? What can I do to improve the lives of other people? Why is this happening to me? I didn't know that I was so privileged. I didn't know that I was so honored to have this particular human experience, whatever it is. And what can I take away? And how can I grow? Before enlightenment, why is this happening to me? After enlightenment, why is this happening to me? And will I seize the opportunity? Will I take full advantage? of the circumstance that I find myself in. So if indeed this text is about eliminating anxiety, 
being able to function in a world that is tense and chaotic and stress-filled without any worry. That's a, it's a tall order. It's a difficult thing to accomplish. Those three steps that I outlined before, I, I heard a phrase once, and it was habits of the heart. And that resonates with me. So those three steps can become habits of the heart. And you can actually step outside of yourself and observe what's happening. You say, here comes this information. How am I going to receive it? How am I going to be in the universe? The elimination of anxiety in your life depends upon acceptance and surrender. And I don't use those two words as substitutes for resignation and giving up. Okay? That's not what we're talking about. Acceptance of your human experience. Acceptance of the idea that you are a spiritual being having a human experience. Acceptance that there are some things that it's just the way that it is and you can't change it. Acceptance of your current circumstance doesn't necessarily mean that you don't work to change it. It just means that you, do, you don't resist it. And then you surrender to that spirit. You surrender to the workings of the universe. You surrender to God. You surrender your faith and your trust. Knowing that at some point this human experience will end. Whenever that is. But at the end of that human experience you will continue to be a spiritual being. So this text, as difficult as it is, I think has an important message for us. And that message is, don't worry. Today has enough trouble all of its own. We don't need to add any to tomorrow by worrying about it today. So food for thought. Go in peace. Amen.